Good afternoon, my name is Emily Underwood. I'm the Community Initiative Specialist at the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us for today's STL History Live installment, uh, James Eads Beyond the Bridge with our very own Community Tours Manager, Amanda Clark. The Missouri Historical Society hosts two to three of the STL History Live programs every week. So be sure to check out our full lineup at mohistory.org or you can find the um, lineup under the events on the Missouri History Museum's Facebook page. The next program coming up is Myth and Reality of Hop Alley, the Chinese American Community in St. Louis, which will be on uh, Tuesday, May 26th at 11 o'clock a.m. And before we get started, I wanna take just a moment to express some gratitude. First, I wanna say a big thank you to all of our members. Um, we really are so appreciative of your support um, that helps keep programs like the STL History Live programs running. Um, I also want to uh, let you know if you're not a member, but if you're interested in learning more about our member program, uh, you can check in the chat. I've posted a URL where you can go and find more information so you can copy and paste that if you're interested. I also want to acknowledge the support of the Zoo Museum Tax District with a sincere thank you to everyone here in the St. Louis region for your tax contributions. Our program today is going to run about 25-30 minutes, followed by some time for Q&A. You can submit questions through the Q&A button you'll see down there at the bottom of your chat in the toolbar. Um, we would appreciate it if you would hold off until close to the end of the presentation to start posting your questions, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can in the time that we have after the presentation. We are providing closed captioning today, and you can turn that on. You should have uh, something in your toolbar that says turn on subtitles or turn subtitles on that may be under an option that says more. Um, so please feel free to do that if you need it. And also, if you want to go back and rewatch any portion of today's program or any of the other STL History Live presentations, you can find those all on the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel. Um, and they are usually posted the Monday after they um, air live. So finally, at the end of the presentation, we would love to get your feedback. You'll notice that at some point during this uh, program, a pop-up tab will show up with a short survey. So it should just take a minute of your time. So please fill it out. Let us know what you think about today's program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter today. So take it away, Amanda. Thank you, Emily. Hi, everybody. As I said, my name is Amanda Clark, and for the Missouri Historical Society, I am the Community Tours Manager, which means that I will be heading up a program that will be starting in July. We'll be doing walking tours and eventually bus tours, but we're going to start with walking tours of the neighborhoods and the great history of this city. Um, James Buchanan Eads is a super dreamy subject for me to get to do a talk on. He is one of my very favorite St. Louis history topics. So um, I'm very excited you guys are all here today to hear me talk about my very favorite thing um, to talk about. So let's get started. Uh, this presentation got uh, is happening because it's this guy's birthday. So James Buchanan Eads was born on May 23rd of 1820. So he is just about to be 200 years old. So it's a good way to celebrate your 200th birthday by having uh, a nice little presentation done about you. Um, so we're going to have a, the world's tiniest and shortest little birthday party uh, real quick here for James. Uh, let's put a little hat on him. I picked that out for him special. Um, I baked him a cupcake. Um, and we're going to quickly, silently sing happy birthday, happy birthday, James. And he's going to blow out the candle and then we're done with our party. So thank you for hopefully humoring me with my little birthday party for James Buchanan Eads. All right, let's get going with the actual presentation. So James Buchanan Eads, like I said, um, he was born in 1820, and he is the third child of his parents. Um, he was born in this area of the country. So he's born in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Um, his father is someone who has a lot of it, is educated. He is someone who doesn't quite do well with business. And so he has to move his family around a lot during James's early life to, in the pursuit of better business opportunities. So there, James was born in Lawrenceburg, and then they moved to Cincinnati years after that, and then on to Louisville. And it is from Louisville, when James is in just about to be a teenager, it is from Louisville where the family leaves to head to St. Louis. James's mom actually gets on the steamboat um, with 
James and his two older sisters, and the four of them journey ahead of his father. His father hangs behind. The, mom, the idea is that uh, James's mom will take the family to St. Louis, get them settled, get a house, get everything ready to go, and then the dad will follow. So you can imagine the, the four of them are on the steamboat. They're heading up, the, uh, up and down and around the Ohio River. Um, it is said that while on the boat from Louisville, um, James is described as having a gentle manner, but his energy was appalling. Um, and he is noted as constantly being follow, you know, following the pilot around, always wanting to see the mechanics of the boat, talking about how he's already built his own little steam engine and he has ideas for another one he's going to build when he gets to St. Louis. Keep in mind, he's just 12, 13 years old at this point. So they finally, they get up you know, down the Ohio and it is um, at Cairo, Illinois, is where James first sees the Mississippi River. Um, and Cairo, so this is a painting of Cairo around the time that James would have, and his family would have been coming through. This is where the Ohio River meets the Mississippi. So it's south of St. Louis. So the two rivers meet here and then the steamboats chug up the river up to St. Louis. So this is where he sees the river that's gonna define the rest of his life. And not just define it, but he's gonna go on, you know, and, and this is such a moving thought to me, is what it felt like when he saw that river for the first time. He's gonna go on in his life to sail on the river. He's gonna walk at the bottom of it. He's gonna build a navy for it. He's gonna span it with steel. He is going to try and control it at certain times. He's going to, um, and in a way he's gonna die for it. And his life is going to is really be defined by this river and this thing. So he, they make their way up to St. Louis and as fate would have it, the night before they're to get off of the steamboat, they are so close to St. Louis, they can see the lights and they're ready to start their new life the next morning. The boat catches fire and sinks and eight people die. Um, everyone in James's family is safe. They do get off the boat in time, but with nothing but the clothes on their backs. So here they've made this big journey. They get to St. Louis and they start with nothing. And so his mom has to you know, instantly get to work at finding a place for them to live, meeting, you know, trying, she depends on the kindness of strangers for them to have a place to live and clothes and things. Um, and James gets, you know, they get settled here in St. Louis. And so this is in the 1830s when this happened. And this is what St. Louis looks like at this time. So this is the St. Louis that James Buchanan Eves arrives in at the age of 13. So it's starting to look like a real city, right? It founded in 1764, the village. Uh, by this time, it's, you know, we've got a great street grid going. We have, you know, Chateau's Pond is still out there. Um, the city is really, is really getting its, its feet underneath it and starting to grow. So this great St. Louisan, this man who's gonna go on to have this massive impact on our city, he steps into a St. Louis where in the 1830s, you know, William Greenleaf Elliott is somewhere pre preaching at the Unitarian Church. Elliott is the founder of Washington University. Um, somewhere else, James uh, Meacham is, is preaching and, and Meacham is a pastor at the African Church. And so he is noted for um, educating enslaved children at a time when that was illegal. And so these, there are so many great things happening in our city and things that will go on to, ha to affect its history. And here's teenage James hopping off a boat um, for his new city. The two images I have on the screen, um, the one on the left, you'll see it says First Presbyterian Church, which is interesting, but it's uh, 4th Street looking south. And so that dome you see in the far distance is the original version of the old courthouse. So, um, and then to the right, you have what we know of as the old cathedral, at the time it was just the cathedral. And um, you're seeing one of the first images of it in its closest to its most modern form when they had, had built it to that size. So again, this, I just wanna set the scene for 1830s St. Louis. So James is down on the river there. You know, he doesn't have, um, doesn't have a job or anything. He's a young teenager. And he, but he is an entrepreneur at heart. And so he starts selling apples and he's quite good at it. He's hustling and selling apples. And there's a man that notices, the guy that owns a dry goods store. Um, the store is called Williams and Deering. And he takes him on as an employee. And as part of him being an employee, he notices that James has such an aptitude for mechanics and engineering and learning. Um, and so he gives him free reign in the library. Uh, the man lives, uh, has his home above the store and has a, 
a robust personal library and lets James just have at it. And so in the evenings, any free time he has, he is either watching the river, he's working on little prototypes of steamboats, or he's reading in this library. So it's perfect. Um, and good to point out at this point that James Buchanan Ease was never formally educated. Like everything that, um, that he does, he does just from pure like taking on this information, learning it, and having this passion. So he's working, the store, as you saw in, in the previous slide, the store is on First Street. So he's right there at the river. He's watching things coming and going. It is pretty much everyone, every you know, young guy's dream at the time to someday work on the river. Same thing with James. And when he, um, he finally gets a job on a boat, and that boat, shortly after he has the job, it's called the Knickerbocker. And the Knickerbocker, this is in 1839, the Knickerbocker sinks one day. Um, everyone's fine, but it sinks with a huge amount of lead on it. And James Nook is there to hear, you know, how much freight was lost, what the value of that was. Um, and this kind of sets him to thinking that he could design a way to efficiently go to the bottom of the river and bring up that freight. And he looks around, there's stuff falling off of boats everywhere. Like this could be something, um, this could be a really big deal. And so young James in 1842, he, um, and the so he's credited, you know, James Buchanan Eads is, is one of his big deals is the diving bell. Um, and this is something that people were figuring out at the time as ways to dive into the river, how to get down to the bottom, they're trying out different methods. Um, and I want to point out before we talk about the boats, just what a diving bell is. Um, in my mind, my early days of researching this, for some reason in my head, it was you know, a bubble helmet and that's it. But no, it is a heavy it's a heavy you know, metal bell, or in the early days, uh, James was using a whiskey barrel. Um, it's, it's some kind of um, container that you drop to the bottom of the river, and then you cannot see out of it, and you are feeling your way with a stick or with your hands, with your feet. Sounds terrifying and crazy. Um, and you can probably not surprise that when James himself like designs these things that uh, no one really takes him up on the offer to go do it. And so he does it himself and he goes to the bottom of the river. That image to the left shows a boat dropping a diving bell down. Um, and that's going to come be important in a moment. So in 1842, uh, James walks into the office of a Saint, uh, two St. Louis boat builders. And he has this idea. He has these drawings. And he says, here's a drawing for a boat, a salvage boat. And it's, he's going to call it a submarine. And it's designed for a boat that would have a system of pulleys and mechanics and hydraulic things that will drop the diving bell down and have the strength to pull a good amount of freight back up. And he says, not only is this a great design, but if you will build it for free, and if you will build all these diving bells for free, I'll give you a partnership in this company, in this, in this endeavor. And these guys say yes. And so they build submarine number one. And so here's submarine number seven. So this is the image that I could find. The submarine number one would have been a, a simpler version of this. And so it has a system of levers and pulleys that drop that. Uh, we're going to go back one slide. Now that you've seen submarine number, what the, that boat looks like, you'll see kind of how it works. So it lowers the bell down and the diver down. Um, and this is going to come in handy for James later when he's building that big bridge. Uh, he knows that when you get to the bottom of the river, you're not just getting to rock, you have to now navigate sand and deeper mud and heavier mud and the currents to get to what it is you need to bring back up. That stuff is not just sitting on the top, on the bottom, most likely. So that's, I love that, um, the illustration to the left there of showing how the diver is working, them, working their way down. So there's the summary number seven. So around this time, um, in 1845, James meets his first wife, but uh, it is a romantic marriage, um, a romantic relationship. Her name is Martha Dillon. She's the daughter of a wealthy merchant. And she, um, her father says, no, this marriage is not going to happen. Um, James's mother, Anne, writes a whole bunch of letters begging uh, Martha to reconsider and to defy her father. And eventually she does, and they get married. Um, just like many people who have been married to someone who is also married to their job, um, their relationship is one in which they are physically separated for most of their marriage. Um, she, you know, bears the burden of child rearing, and she also, for most of the time, is in Iowa, where her parents, James's parents, have moved on to. Um, so she 
taking on all of this while he is spending weeks, months, you know, all this time at the bottom of the river or uh, sailing up and down it um, in search of to build his salvage company. But in the early days of their marriage, when they first get married, he realizes what strain this is going to put on this, this young marriage. And so he quits. He, he walks away from the salvage business. And then he, in 1845, and he opens the first glass factory west of the Mississippi River. It is quickly apparent in the next couple of years that is not a good business venture. And so while it did keep him home with his family, um, he walks, he leaves the, that, um, that business venture in 1848, the business fails. Um, at this time, they are having, they've had a couple of children. They've had a son uh, named James as well. Um, and so he goes back to the salvage business, builds a second submarine boat, number two. So that's where he's set up and we're setting him up now for 1848 to 1849. So 1849 in St. Louis is kind of like the 2020s. It's a lot like this year is going. And then it's one thing after another. And so the city is suffering from a major cholera outbreak. And in the middle of all of that, in May of that year, a massive fire breaks out on the riverfront. And it, by the time it's done, not only has it decimated a huge chunk of the city, but it's also um, sunk 23 steamboats. And so James looks out and says, that's a lot of stuff that I can bring back up. And so he's actually able to use this opportunity to quickly get to work, um, figure out a way to get all of that back up, different boats, different, you know, how is he going to do this? And so he actually makes, um, it's a misfortune for St. Louis, but a huge boom for him uh, financially and professionally. So he brings up um, a good percentage of that sunken cargo. And it's also that year um, after all the after the fire in May, his son James uh, dies in June. And at the same time, he builds the third salvage boat, number three. Number four, summary, summary number four is also built that year in Paducah, Kentucky. So his business is growing pretty quickly. In the middle of all this, you know, Martha, as I mentioned earlier, is bearing the, um, the brunt of the family, you know, side of this. And she's complaining, she's writing letters to him and saying, please, I need your help, I need you here. She needs her husband. Um, James's response was to send her to Vermont for a rest cure, something that was popular at the time. And so he sends her to Vermont to rest and to recuperate. Um, and it's on that trip when she's coming back um, in 1852, she's coming back on that trip, he contracts cholera and she passes away. Um, so now he has, you know, he's She's completely devastated, um, and he swears to give up diving forever at this point. This is 1853. In 1854, he does remarry. He has, um, there's a lady, Eunice Hagerman Eads, who was, is the widow of his cousin. And so they marry um, here in St. Louis. He is at, you know, he's needing a break mentally, physically. They, the two of them go, and this is Eunice, here on the left, and this is their house that was in Compton Avenue in St. Louis. The two of them go to Europe, they take a break, and he gets the mental rest that he needs. Um, at the same time, in 1855, they get back, he buys more boats. At this point, he's not buying salvage boats, he's buying snag boats. So these are boats that would go up and down the river ahead of, you know, constantly trolling for um, fallen trees and debris, because anytime a flood came through, all that stuff got redistributed. And so he buys five snag boats and converts them into more salvage boats. There's a huge fleet of these things going. 1855 is also the first time, separate from him, elsewhere in the world. 18, that point is when there's, there starts to be rumors in St. Louis of a bridge, that we're going to need a bridge um, eventually to get across the river and to bring rail traffic across. Um, in 1856, it's the first time that a railroad reaches the eastern shore of St. Louis. And there's nowhere for it to go, so it has to go on a ferry and go across from there. In 1856, Eads's mother's first cousin, James Buchanan, becomes president, fun family thing. Um, so Eads retires in 1857. He has this huge fleet of boats. He's made all this money. 1857, he retires. He's very young. He's in his 40s. Um, and he ret retires with a fortune of $500,000. And this is in 1857. Um, at that point, it is estimated that his company had brought up over 50 boats. And that's not counting just the, you know, the, rest, the salvage that they brought up, they've, they've brought up over 50 boats um, over the years. 
1861, the Civil War starts, um, and Eads is first, he's brought into Washington, D.C. To, to consult with them on how the Union Army can protect the waterways and the inland waterways. And then he's asked to design and create these Ironside boats or design some kind of uh, vessel that, that could be an advantage for the Union Army. And so he goes down to Carondelet, uh, that is south of downtown St. Louis, and he purchases what was an existing um, shipyard, and he gets to work building these boats. And several of them are, are built there at that shipyard. He also contracts out to other um, shipyards here and in, uh, outside of St. Louis to get these things built. They are steel hulled, metal hulled um, boats that some of them, and it, that way if they're shot at, you know, they have protection. And so he proposes, he builds seven, ultimately. Um, they are all constructed in under 100 days and, and they sent to work. Um, by 1862, they are helping the Union Army win major battles. So in 1862, they are part of the battle at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River. 1863, they are crucial in the Vicksburg, Mississippi battle. Um, but he's really a big part of the Union Army. And there were ironclad boats. The Confederate had someone building them as well. But, and you see a little, the photograph in the lower left there is a, the patent model um, for the gun carriages and how that would work uh, to get out of them. So in 1864, he needs another mental break because these, these ships, all of this stuff has taken its toll on him again. Um, it's to point, and I want to point out that at this point, he has spent now you know, 20 years going to the bottom of the river and up, the bottom of the river and up. And so what we know now of the effects that kind of pressure on your body has, he didn't know. And so he's just, his body is wearing out from all of that, um, the, the pressure from the water over the years. And so he's exhausted mentally. His body health is not holding up. So he takes another break and he goes to Europe. Um, and then at this point, the iron boat, the boats are still out there helping the Union Army um, in Mobile Bay and Alabama is another uh, fight that they're, they're crucial in. In 1866, he's back. And at this point, well, this is the shipyard before I get ahead of myself. Um, super excited to get to the bridge. But before we get to the bridge, I'm gonna point on the left is um, an image of the shipyards. And then on the right, so I've got us downtown. I'm going to show you where the shipyards are now. If you head down south, right to the mouth of the River De Pair, the site um, in a moment is going to get close to it. It is still a wide open space, and it was a shipyard. It was sold and you know passed through different hands throughout the 20th century as well. So it was a shipyard late into the 20th century, actually. So that's where those boats were all constructed. Now there's a pasta factory there. Right, so I, I talked about earlier the bridge discussion starting to happen. Um, it is obvious in St. Louis that after the Civil War, as reconstruction starts and economic reconstruction is going to, if it's going to happen, it's going to involve a bridge. Chicago has a, there's already a line. Uh, someone has built a bridge north of St. Louis at Rock Island. Um, the bridge doesn't stand very long before it's hit by a steamboat. Um, so it shows some structural problems, but it is rebuilt quickly. Um, there is a lawsuit that is filed um, by ferry companies and different political groups that are against the idea of the railroad. Um, and so it goes pretty far into this legal battle before we can get a bridge built. In the 1860s, there is a meeting of, uh, there's an engineer, like the National Committee of Engineers comes to St. Louis for their annual committee and he gives them his plans for this bridge idea that he has and they have this great report where they say this can't be built and this is why. Um, I own an original copy of that and it's pretty fun to read knowing the bridge got built. What you're seeing here on the screen is uh, a photo of a Wiggins Ferry and a, a ticket there for a Wiggins Ferry company um, to get across the river. Wiggins Ferry had the monopoly on the ferry business. And this is something that it would take freight across the river, it take people across the river. Um, they really had a hot, tight hold on this. And so they're one of the major forces in fighting the bridge getting built. By the end of the 1860s though, the bridge, the designs have been started. 
Um, the, the bridge company has been founded that's going to get this thing built. And then um, Ease is named engineer in chief in 1867. And it's not because a room full of people looked around and said, who's the best engineer in the room? Oh, it's that guy. No, Ease is, he's smart business wise. He knows, the, he has the engineering knowledge. He has the knowledge of the river and he also knows how to finance stuff like this. So he just has all of these things going and he gets himself appointed um, head of this endeavor. And so the, the bridge gets started um, in earnest in, in the late 1860s. By 1869, so here's Eve looking pretty proud of himself there. And here's some stock on the right here, stock in the Illinois and St. Louis bridge companies. That's who gets the bridge built. By 1869, they are sink. They are getting the, the first of the caissons, and so that's one of the big things that um, and Eads helps figure out. One of his big engineering feats are these caissons, the, the piers. So a way to get the piers sunk into the river to make the, the bridge stable. I want to point out, if you're looking at the this big image in the middle, that it looks like it's a technical drawing. You see how they've they've tunneled it down through the, the sand bed, pretty far down into that sand. And then you get, if you look closely at the bottom, there are people working down at the bottom. And so these men would go down that staircase every day and be working and shoveling and tunneling out at the bottom and slowly that would sink the case on down until it gets to that bedrock. It's pretty amazing if you think about it, that people did this, you know, were able to do this work. Um, as this, the caissons are getting lower and lower in the river though, they are starting to notice that the workers are having health, their health effects. Um, and so they tried different things. At first, they're only going to go down for four hours, still having bad health effects. Um, and then, so then they start, they start sh shortening those, um, shortening those shifts down to two hours, and then the two hour rest. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. And this is what leads to later the uh, discovery of the bends or the caissons disease, that water pressure and the quick depression, moving from that heavy pressure goes to regular, um, regular pressure is the toll that it's having on their bodies, um, is what they discover for the building of the bridge. So I've got a nice shot on the left there of the spans being connected. So once the caissons are all in place and the piers are all done um, in 1870, so it doesn't take very long to get those piers in. And then in 18, um, 1873, they start building the the arches. And so the arches are all made out of steel, uh, Carnegie steel. So it's, it's always good to have friends in good places. Um, and Andrew Carnegie could be counted as one of Eads' friends. So while all this is happening and our world is changing here in St. Louis, Eads is already on to his next project. Um, I'm fascinated by him as a person because he works so hard at giant things. It's like he can't do anything small, right? He, he has these big visions. And so his next thing that he's on while the bridge is being finished. Eads has taken a trip down to New Orleans, and he's very interested in how you can open up the port to boats that can also go to sea, right? So not just steamboats leaving the Mississippi River, but how can you open that up? And then you're opening it wide open for ocean, uh, ocean faring uh, boats to be able to go. So he starts to plan a way for this to happen. And so an idea is, is planted in his head of figuring this out this problem, how you can deepen the channel, because not, it's not just about coming up with a deep channel there at the mouth of the Mississippi, but it's always moving. So the currents are always moving that sand around. How can you get a permanently deep, um, deep channel? So the bridge, so he's thinking about this. Meantime, the bridge opens. So the bridge is getting built. Um, everything is completed in 1874. It starts to open slowly. Foot traffic on May 23rd. So this weekend would be an anniversary of that. Um, and his birthday. Uh, that's a good way to celebrate your birthday. Um, and then in June, a month later, vehicle traffic is able to start crossing. Um, and a week later, the first railroad train goes across. Um, it turns out that the train was too wide for the tunnel when it got to St. Louis. So it leaves from Illinois and it was too wide for the tunnel. So that was, it had to reverse and, and cross back the side. And then um, before they could open it to make do the grand opening for the bridge, they walked an elephant across the bridge for the public to see. Um, this was not because to show how strong the bridge was, it could hold up an elephant. 
Um, it was because at the time, bridges were, you know, throughout, there were, up until that time, there were several large bridges that had um, given way and rivers and there had been train accidents and people had died, including one of Eads's uh, business partners. And it was a myth or you know, thought to be that an elephant would not cross, um, would not cross something that wasn't stable, that it had a sense of that. And so, he, so they, they marched the, the elephant across to show that this thing is really stable. And then a few days later, they take a line of 14 locomotives uh, back and forth over the bridge to show also how strong it is. And uh, William Tecumseh Sherman is actually part of that celebration. And that um, at that time, uh, he was quite the celebrity in St. Louis. July 4th of that year, 1874, is when the bridge officially opens. There are 300,000 people that come to attend the celebration. That's a good, huge percentage, of, if not more, of the city's um, population at the time. Um, and it's a huge, it's a huge triumph, not just for our city, um, but for engineering in general. And it's considered just this huge marvel. Um, and it's, when that opens, I mean, that changes. I and mean, even though it's late, and right, it's late in opening, and there's trains going through Chicago, and Chicago is boasting and telling everyone that, you know, they're the new jewel of the river. Us getting the Eads Bridge built, that opens us up to railroad traffic. And then, you know, 20 years later, we have uh, Union Station is built, which is the world's largest train station at the time, and would see so much rail traffic passing through um, for the good first half of the 20th century. So July 28th, so it opens on July 4th. July 28th, there's the bridge right after it's built. You get a nice shot of the, um, the riverfront there. And so this is 1874. Eads resigns from, from being chief engineer of the bridge. In 1875, he is, he's already off. His mind is back in New Orleans, and he's trying to handle the, get this jetties idea. Um, and in 18... 70, um, also in 1875, the St. Louis Bridge Company goes bankrupt and changes hands. So he got out of that in time. Um, something that was said about him multiple times in different biographies and by his colleagues is that not only did Eads have good, be smart in engineering and math and those kinds of things, he also knew when to get out, when to walk away from something um, at the right time. His, his, his ability as a financier uh, was just as big as the engineering. Um, Drinks that he had. So he's down in New Orleans and he has brought a plan to Congress. He has gotten this. So this is like Eads, to us St. Louisans, this is Eads Forgotten Project. It's such a big deal. Something that even plays out in Hurricane Katrina during the floods because it's, you know, this plays out with how water um, in the bay works in New Orleans. So he designs this idea. The, before his plan for jetties, the overruling idea that um, the the government's engin civil engineer had um, was that there would be sandbars. They were going to put artificial sandbars that would keep the water flow and then you'd be able to make this deeper channel. And um, Eads not only says, no, that's not going to work. This jetties are what you should do. And he, uh, the painting on the left shows the jetties being built. If you look in the lower, there's a, one of the paintings in the lower left, it looks like a raft being built. Um, and that's basically what they were. They were piers. Think of you. Piers of wood and there wooden wooden piers that had um, straw mattress, like like this packed in straw, and then they were built up from there. And so that was meant to, you know, divert the water away and help with getting that deeper channel. They are still there today, although from the NASA uh, satellite photograph on the right, you can see that the sand has uh, accumulated around them. But their Eads Bridge are still there. Um, there and it was called Eads Port or Port Eads, um, and this was getting once this was built. And they they get that down to 13 feet. Um, so then we're going to. So he, let's go right back to New Orleans. So this is big, right? He's built the bridge. He's built these boats. He's built this bridge. Then he's gone to New Orleans and changed, opened up New Orleans river traffic a thousandfold. Now they can get ships out in the ocean. So he's done that, still not enough. He's got one more big, big idea. Um, and his next big idea that he goes to Congress and lobbies for and is this. And he has this idea next that if it's kind of the opposite of the Eads Bridge, 
that he wants to make a ship railroad in Mexico. And it would, it would uh, cross the isthmus, there in the middle we can see the arrow pointing to it, that it would traverse that isthmus, it would take the seafaring uh, vessels across it, pulled by railroads, and so, and this is around the time the Panama Canal is being thought of and, and designed as well. So this is his last big kind of plan that he's putting in front of Congress, trying to get built, and he believes in it so strongly that he goes to the Mexican government to negotiate the charter himself. In 1881, he goes to Congress and says, if you don't approve this, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for this whole thing um, as long as you, you know, pay me back if it works, if it happens. He goes to Mexico again. Um, they start work actually clearing the way for it. Um, however, Congress uh, sets it aside and they keep refusing to vote on it. And so it never gets going um, any further than just clearing the ground for it. In 1884, Eads is uh, awarded the Albert Medal in, by, the, by Britain's Royal Society. They give him the the Albert Medal for services he had rendered to the art of engineering. And so this, he's the first American to win this award. Um, it's pretty amazing. And they, they move, at this point, him and his wife moved to New York City and they bought a house on 53rd Street. They've left St. Louis, they've made this huge fortune um, and they've moved away from St. Louis. He passes away in 1887, so he, um, he and his wife and his stepdaughter had, they take a cruise down, not a cruise, but they're on a ship, they go to the Bahamas, and he does pass away um, during that trip. He is buried at Bell Fountain Cemetery, so you can go hang out with him there, um, as, I do, as I do from time to time. Um, and so he passed away in 1887, and the Panama Canal opens in 1914, like, so all this stuff keeps you know, going without him. In, 18, in 1932, the deans of the American Colleges of Engineering name him as one of the five greatest engineers of all time, and they rank him alongside Da Vinci and Thomas Edison. So his legacy, he has this huge, you know, legacy left behind. Um, in the 1970s, the last train crosses the Eads Bridge, and, and, and then we've renovated it now, and we have trains and cars going across it. There's a poem there on the right, uh, Lines on the Life and Death of Captain James Buchanan Eads that was published um, afterwards. So I want to, so that's, that's the life of James Buchanan Eads. That's the big, extraordinary, big life. Um, and before we move on to Q&A, and hopefully there's lots of good questions and things I can, um, it's kind of hard to fit such a big life into such a short amount of time. I'm gonna show a few cool things I found in the Missouri History Museum's collections. Um, on the left there is a, this was part of a tobacco package. And so um, a tobacco company that I'm blanking on at this moment, but a tobacco company uh, had their packs of cigarettes and then inside they had little history books. And so this was the cover of the James Buchanan's Eads cigarette pack. And inside of that would have several pages of tiny typewritten uh, the story of his life. That's on a little tobacco package. Um, this is his pass. This is his own pass. During the Civil War, um, you had to have kind of like a passport to leave and come from the city and know where people were going. So he has this. Uh, he has this pass from the marshal uh, that he can go anytime he likes. He doesn't have to ask. He can come and go. That's interesting um, description of his arts. Uh, the Albert Medal. This was the cover that I found to an, a banquet that was held in his honor in the um, early 1870s that was, or sorry, late 1870s that the city of St. Louis put on and it was a, a big banquet with all this food and entertainment and talks and it was for the, um, it was a pretty big, big thing they were doing just in his honor, just because he's a great guy. Um, this was a medal that he was in the um, Hall of Engineering Hall of Fame at Harvard. And this is the back of that medal. And I just love this image of Poseidon taming the river. And that was the symbol they were using for Eads. The last thing, um, there are lots of letters in the Missouri Historical Society's um, collection. So there's lots of letters for their Eads and they're ones that from very famous people and historic people and normal citizens and different friends. There are these letters that always, you know, they're talking about the bridge design, they're talking about health. Um, you know, there's all this stuff going back and forth. They're 
fascinating read. This is one of my favorite uh, ones that I found where the friend is uh, talking about how much him and his wife enjoyed the bottle of Missouri wine that Eves sent his way. And at the bottom, he says, I must make apology for my former doubts about its quality. And so I think that's kind of fun. I know as a St. Louisan, you know, talking about wine country in Missouri, and you have to explain that outside of the area. But I found, I found it kind of fun that even in the 1800s, people were having to explain Missouri wine. Or say it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The last fun thing I found is I looked at the address of the house where um, James and his wife, Eunice, uh, moved in, to, in New York. And sitting on that spot now is the MoMA Design Store, um, which is sitting right across from the museum. So the Museum of Modern Art is sitting right where James Buchanan Eves lived in New York City. And last, before we go to Q&A, this is a very famous quote of Walt Whitman's. Uh, he, Walt Whitman spent a lot of time in St. Louis. His brother was an engineer here. Um, he actually built one of the water towers in North St. Louis. It was the engineer for that. And so um, that's not him on the left. This is just a cool photo. But the quote is, I have haunted the river every night lately where I could get a look at the bridge by moonlight. It is indeed a structure of perfection and beauty, unsurpassable, and I never tire of it. And I totally get what he means. It's a great bridge. Okay, so before we do that, I'm going to stick to my Q&A uh, screen here. I'm going to open up. Now I'm opening up the Q&A, so if you have. Let's see, what happened to Eve's children after their mother died? Um, it's a great question. They were, you know, they were living up with his parents. Um, they did come to St. Louis to live with uh, him and his new wife in their larger house. Okay. All right, well, I'm not seeing a lot of questions come through. So if you have any more, think of a question, ever wanna talk uh, Eves with me, you can find me at the museum. Uh, my email is aclark at mohistory.org. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. <laughs> that was great. If we can go to the next slide, I just want to uh, give some thank yous. Um, I want to make sure to thank this program was in association with our Miami, Mississippi exhibit. We certainly hope that we're able to welcome you all back to that exhibit very soon. Um, but I want to thank all of the sponsors who you can see on the screen um, for their support for the exhibit and its programming. Of course, I want to thank Amanda again and Jody, who did our captioning today, and all of you for being with us. And I'm actually going to ask Amanda to stop sharing her screen, and I'm going to share one final slide with you um, to show you the upcoming programs. Here we go. And I'm going to just try to make that bigger for you. There we go. So you can see all of the great programs we have coming up over the next week or so. And then I just want to remind you, your, as I said before, your feedback is always important to us. So hopefully you can see there's a tab that has popped up with a little bit of a survey. Should just take a couple minutes. So we really appreciate that um, in advance. I want to thank you for your time with that. And thanks again for being here today and uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you all.